Hi, Bob Powell here with George Padula, Chief Investment Officer of Madeira Wealth. And George recently published an article on Retirement Daily about rebalancing. George, first of all, welcome to our uh, broadcast here. Thank you, Bob. Great to see you again. Pleasure, pleasure. So we were happy to publish your article about rebalancing. It's a topic that is, um, well, let's say it, it's, a, it's a topic that needs to be addressed because so few people understand uh, when and how to do it. Mm -hmm. So let's have you start by talking a little bit about what rebalancing is. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, what we see in, in times like this, you know, market volatility, market changes, you know, there's a lot of emotion around what people should or shouldn't do. And there can be an, almost an analysis of paralysis. And so we think about rebalancing as taking the emotion out of it, being able to say, here's a structure, here's a process that I have that is going to align my portfolio in the way that long-term is going to be beneficial for me and, and my long-term objectives. So the whole idea, very simply, if you think about a, a two-asset portfolio, the very easy stocks and bonds, if you are, say, 50-50, and all of a sudden something, you know, either the markets are moving up and, or the markets are moving down, and that 50% stocks, 50% bonds portfolio might now be 40% on one or 60% on the other, you are getting yourself out of, uh, out of alignment in terms of that long-term risk. And you, you think about rebalancing as being able to buy when prices are low and sell when values are higher, right? So the process of rebalancing would be to say, you know what, equities are going down or have gone down. By definition, something else has to have gone up. So I'm going to sell the 10% of those things that have gone up and I'm going to be buying 10% of those things that have gone down to get me back into my long-term alignment. It's almost as though thinking about it as a dollar cost averaging, you're buying when prices are lower. You might not be able to hit the exact bottom of the market, but having a structure, having a discipline, having a process really, really does help and takes, takes away that emotion of when to do it and how to do it. And it really makes a difference long-term for, for folks. And mm -hmm. when you ex start to expand it out beyond just stocks and bonds, then you're talking large cap and small cap, you're talking treasury and corporates, you're talking real estate, you're adding in all of these different layers and different accounts, and it really does become part of a process. And, and so for us, the way we think about it is really creating that structure, creating the process and creating the discipline to be able to do it and how to do it. Right. So uh, we should mention that part of the process of rebalancing is also dictated by your investment policy statement, which uh, originally dictated what percent should be in stocks, bonds, and cash or other assets. Right. No, absolutely. An investment policy statement helping to identify what uh, the goals are, what the returns are, what the risk parameters are, what individual circumstances are, uh, tax parameters, strategies. And so you're creating the you know, creating the guardrails, so to speak. If you think about kind of driving down the highway, right? You're driving down the highway and you can either, you know, you're, there's three lanes on the highway and you're, you're driving down the left-hand lane of the highway and you're driving really fast. Someone else is driving in the middle lane. Someone else is driving in the right-hand lane. You're all going the same direction, but your ways of getting there could be a little bit different. And so you're creating the guardrails around your lanes. Do you want to be more, uh, you want to get there faster and take more risk. Do you want to be slower and steadier and and, uh, and and not have to worry about as much? So it's almost as though the, the investment policy statement is setting up those guardrails of how much do I want to let the portfolio move? So in the case that I just mentioned, you know, hypothetical case, 50-50, well, you don't really want to be rebalancing every day. You want to have enough enough room there. Right. You, you don't want to be 50 50 every single day because you want to let things move around. You want to have some you don't want to overwhelm in terms of transactions uh, costs or, or just rebalancing every day. So maybe you set your guardrails out at 10 percent. Maybe you set them at 15 percent for things that are going to move uh, more. Maybe you bring them in a little bit for things that are a little bit less risky. Right. So creating that if you're 50 50, maybe 60 40. On, or 60% on the high side, 40% on the low side. So as you approach that 60%, you're saying to yourself, okay, now I've got to pair back down to the 50. Or if I'm at the lower 40, I've got to start to buy and get myself back up to 50. 
Mm. So in the article, George, you mentioned also some of the benefits of rebalancing. People have always debated that, whether it improves returns or improves risk-adjusted returns, mm-hmm. but you outlined several benefits. To, mm-hmm. yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, really the, one of the big benefit is, is making sure that, you know, you have a process and you have procedures. And, and a couple of the examples I mentioned in, in the article you, know, you think about uh, the miracle on the Hudson, Captain Sullenberger, for example, right? Here's, a, here's someone who has literally people's lives in his hands. And he has trained and he has a process and he has a, almost a checklist of things that he has to do. And, they, and, and the rebalancing is that checklist. What do I need to do when A happens? What do I need to do when B happens? And, and walking through those processes ahead of time makes a, makes a big difference. And even, you know, the other example I use was, you know, in the, uh, in the Apollo mission, Apollo 13, again, going back to the checklist, going back to the processes, you know, being trained and, 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 and having that experience. But you're doing that in a neutral environment. In, in, when things get emotional, in, in, uh, you think, I think back to, you know, 2008, 2001, this year in March, you know, there are evil, just an enormous amount of emotions around the markets, around everything happening. And if you have set your investment policy ahead of time, you've set your parameters for rebalancing ahead of time, then you follow the process and, uh, and, you, and you stick to that process. And I think it's uh, really the right thing to do so you don't get you know, too tied up in the emotions. Right. So in terms of when to rebalance, um, Obviously, many people have different theories about that quarterly, semi-annually, mm-hmm. annually, uh, mm-hmm. the, the triggers. Do, do you have a favorite method to use in terms of when to rebalance? Yeah, we, uh, we typically will rebalance. We, we do it what we call dynamically, right? So we don't do it on a, on a set quarter, four times a year or every month. We do it really when the, when uh, when the dynamics of the portfolio are dictating it to us. So we use... Uh, some pretty sophisticated software to help us, you know, raise the flag. Hey, wait a minute! Now we've got a we've got a situation coming up, and uh, it allows us to start to evaluate it. So if you stick with a strict calendar method, you're probably going to miss some real good opportunities. And I think March of this year was a very good example of that, right? So the bottom of the market was March 23rd. If you had a strict end of quarter time period, you you know. And you waited until March 30th, you missed that bottom of the market. Now, rebalancing also means you don't have to hit the bottom of the market. You know, if you were to rebalance in mid-March and you were to rebalance again in mid uh, mid to beginning of April, you're kind of bookending it, right? You, you don't. You, it's very very hard to, to to time the bottom of the market. But if you have, have the process, you're doing it dynamically. You're going to come pretty close, and I think that's really the, the key thing. But again, it really comes down to Having your investment policy, aligning with your risks and, and goals long term, you know, making sure you understand, uh, you know, how much uh, you want to have in each asset class, being aware of taxes, being aware of any transaction costs uh, that are involved, and again, trying to take that emotion out of the market, trying to make it more process oriented, and uh, and really kind of uh, thinking about it as a um, as a dynamic tool, one of the tools you can use for your your, um, your, your long-term uh, approach. Mm. So obviously many of our readers are in retirement and they, ha- they too have to rebalance their portfolios, but they in some cases also have to take required minimum distributions. Uh, any thoughts about using this opportunity to uh, uh, take distributions in the form of gains that allow you then to rebalance your portfolio? It certainly could be. Uh, this year in 2020, recall uh, that you actually don't have to take a required minimum distribution here in 2020. That's right. So you, you may not need to, but uh, rebalancing is also a good opportunity you know, to kind of shore up your, your cash holdings, uh, shore up uh, your, your, if you are using your portfolio for cash and, and income, it's a good opportunity to do so and, and, and build up. You know, cash is part of a portfolio. There's no question. Part of your asset allocation. So anything that we haven't touched upon that you think we ought to, or anything that we've touched upon that you want to just maybe reemphasize before we, uh, before we wrap up? You know, I think even if, whether you're doing it with an advisor, you, whether you're working on your own, whether you're working uh, through uh, primarily through a custodian, uh, your 401k plans typically have uh, rebalancing 
uh, tools uh, incorporated within them. You can rebalance uh, on a regular basis. You can work with your custodian. You can work with the advisor to to do this. So I think it's uh, it, it it can seem complicated, but it, 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 if you set it and forget it is almost a good good way to do it. But again, you're setting up the process ahead of time and not letting the emotions overwhelm you. I think that's mm -hmm. important. Well, George, thanks ever so much for uh, explaining how to rebalance and when to rebalance. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully you'll come back on and talk about articles that you write for Retirement Daily in the future. Thank you very much, Bob. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.